The nation's thought forms, art forms, and ideas, which are the expression of the development of a culture, are always in the custody of a comparatively small group. How large this group is, how easily it can replenish itself, depends on the character of the culture. In this respect, the classical culture is instructive. Its ideas were one and all exoteric. Socrates conducts his philosophizing in the Agora. In our case, the picture of Leibniz or Descartes carrying on such activity would be ludicrous in the extreme, for Western philosophy is the possession of a very few. But any culture, even the exoteric classical, is restricted for its full expression in whatever direction to certain levels of the populations in its area. Culture is by its very nature selective, exclusive. The use of the word in the personal sense, a cultured man, describes a man out of the ordinary, a man whose ideas and attitudes are ordered and articulated. Cultured in the personal sense means devoted to something beyond oneself and one's own domestic well-being. In the 19th century world picture, with its atomistic mania, only individuals existed, nothing higher. Therefore, the word was used to describe a practitioner or appreciator of art or literature. But patriotism, devotion to duty, ethical imperative, heroism, self-sacrifice are also an expression of culture. Primitive man does not evince them. A war is just as much an expression of culture as a poem, a factory as a cathedral, a rifle as a statue. A high culture in the course of its fulfillment acts in all directions of thought and action and on every person within its area. The intensity of its action in a given direction depends on the culture soul. Some of the cultures have been passionately historical, like the Chinese, some completely ahistoric, like the Indian. Some have developed massive techniques, like the Egyptian and our own. Some have ignored techniques, like the classical and Mexican. The intensity of the impression of the culture on individuals is proportional to their receptivity to spiritual impressions. The individual of small soul and limited horizon lives for himself because he understands nothing else. To such a man, Western music is merely an alternate up and down, loud and soft. Philosophy is mere words. History is a collection of fairy tales, even the reality of which is not inwardly felt. Politics is the selfishness of the great military conscription, a burden which his lack of moral courage forces him to accept. Thus, even his individualism is a mere denial of anything higher and not an affirming of his own soul. The extraordinary man is the one who puts something else before his own life and security. Even as he faced the firing squad, William Walker could have saved his life by merely renouncing his claim to president of Nicaragua. To the common man, this is insane. The common man is unjust, but not on principle. He is selfish, but is incapable of the imperative of Ibsen's exalted selfishness. He is the slave of his passions, but incapable of higher sexual love, for even this is an expression of culture. Primitive man simply would not understand Western erotic if it were explained to him, this sublimation of passion into metaphysics. He lacks any sort of honor and will submit to any humiliation rather than revolt. It is always leader natures who revolt. He gambles in the hope of winning, and if he loses, he whimpers. He would rather live on his knees than die on his feet. He accepts the loudest voice as the true one. He follows the leader of the moment, but only so far. And when the leader is eclipsed by a new one, he points out his record of opposition. In victory, he is a bully. In defeat, he is a lackey. His talk is big, his deeds small. He likes to play, but has no sportsmanship. Great thoughts and plans he castigates as megalomania. Anyone who tries to pull him up and along the road of higher accomplishment, he hates. And when the chance offers, he crucifies him like Christ, burns him like Savonarola, kicks his dead body in the square in Milan. He is always laughing at the discomfiture of another, but he has no sense of humor and is equally incapable of true seriousness. He denounces the crime of passion, but eagerly reads the literature of such crimes. He herds in the street to see an accident and enjoys seeing another sustain the blows of fate. He does not care if his countrymen are spilling their blood as long as he is secure. He is everything mean and unheroic, but he lacks the mentality to be Iago or Richard III. He has no access to culture and, when he dares, he persecutes anyone who has. Nothing delights him more than to see a great leader fall. He hated Metternich and Wellington, the symbols of tradition. He refused as Reichstag to send ex-Chancellor Bismarck a birthday greeting. He makes up the constituency of all parliaments everywhere, and he invades all councils of war to advise prudence and caution. If beliefs to which he was committed become dangerous, he recants. They were never his anyway. He is the inner weakness of every organism, the enemy of all greatness, the material of treason. It is not such human stuff that an exacting high culture can use to further its destiny. The common man is the material with which the great political leaders in democratic conditions work. In earlier centuries, the common man did not attend the cultural drama. 
It did not interest him, and the participants were not yet under the rationalistic spell, the counting mania, as Nietzsche called it. When democratic conditions proceed to their extreme, the result is that even the leaders are common men, with a jealous and crooked soul of envy of that to which they are not equal, like Roosevelt in his coterie in America. In his cult of the common man, he was deifying himself, like Caligula. The abolition of quality smothers the exceptional man in his youth and turns him into a cynic. In earlier centuries, there was no suggestion anywhere that the masses of the population had a part to play. When this idea does triumph, it turns out that the only role these masses can play is the passive one of unwieldy building material for the articulate part of the population. What is the physical articulation of the body of the culture? The more exacting the nature of the cultural task, the higher the type of humanity required for its performance. There is in all cultures a spiritual level of the entire population called the culture-bearing stratum. It is this articulation of culture populations alone which makes the expression of a high culture possible. It is the technique of living, the habitus of the culture. The culture-bearing stratum is the custodian of the wealth of expression forms of the culture. To it belongs all the creators in the domains of religion, philosophy, science, music, literature, the arts of form, mathematics, politics, techniques, and war, as well as the non-creators who fully understand and themselves experience the developments in this higher world, the appreciators. So, within itself, the culture-bearing stratum is articulated into creators and appreciators. It is in general the latter who transmit the great creations downward, insofar as this is possible. This process serves to recruit the higher material wherever it appears into the culture-bearing stratum. The process of replenishment is continually going on, but the culture-bearing stratum is not hereditary in any strict sense. The culture-bearing stratum is a purely spiritual level of the populace of the culture. It has no economic, political, social, or other hallmark. Some of its most luminous creators have lived and died in want, ex simply gratia, Beethoven and Schubert. Other souls, equally creative but less rugged, have been strangled by poverty. Chatterton. Many of its creative members go through their lives entirely unnoticed. Mendel, Kierkegaard, Copernicus. Others are mistaken for mere talents. Shakespeare, Rembrandt. The culture-bearing stratum is not recognized by its contemporaries in any way as a unity, nor does it recognize itself as one. As a stratum, it is invisible, like the culture it carries. Because it is a purely psychic stratum, it can be given no material description to satisfy the intellectuals. Even the intellectuals would admit, however, that Europe or America could be thrown into a material chaos from which it would take years to emerge if the few thousands in the higher technical ranks were removed. These technicians are a part of the culture-bearing stratum, although it is not merely occupational. Technicians, of course, like economic leaders or military leaders, play purely subordinate roles in the culture drama. The most important part of this stratum at any one time is the group which is the custodian of the highest idea. Thus in Dante's time, emperor and pope were the two highest symbols of reality, and it was in the service of either one of these symbols that the leading members of the culture-bearing stratum were then to be found. The highest symbolic force was then transferred to the dynasties, and dynastic politics claimed its lives during its centuries. With the coming of enlightenment and rationalism, the whole West goes into a crisis of long duration, and not less does the culture-bearing stratum. It was split even more than usual, and only now, after two centuries, is it possible to restore its basic unity. I say more than usual, for it must not be supposed that the culture-bearing stratum ever was a sort of international, a Freemasonry. On the contrary, it supplied leaders on both sides of every war and every tendency. Within this stratum there is constant struggle between tradition and innovation. The strong, vital part naturally represents the new forward development affirming the next age. It is the function of tradition to assure continuity. Tradition is the memory of a superpersonal soul. It must see that the same creative spirit of the grand past is present at each innovation. The crisis of rationalism places the same frightful strain on the higher stratum that it does on the entire organism. The step forward, democracy, is affirmative in the last analysis because it is an historical necessity in the life of a culture as we know from history. But it is a difficult step for men to take who have given their lives to construction and creation, for to mobilize the masses is to destroy. The step from culture to civilization is a fall, it is the onset of senility. For this reason, leaders whose center of gravity was on the side of culture resisted the revolution of democracy with all their power. Burke, Goethe, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Metternich, Wellington, Carlyle, Nietzsche. The culture-bearing stratum, articulated into creators and appreciators, is invisible as such. 
It corresponds to no economic class, no social class, no nobility, no aristocracy, no occupation. Its members are not all public figures by any means. But by its existence, this stratum actualizes a high culture on this earth. If a process had existed by which members of the stratum could be all selected, the extra-European forces would probably have exterminated it in the attempt to destroy the West. The attempt would not have succeeded, for this stratum is produced by the culture, and after a long period of chaos, a generation or two depending on circumstances, this cultural organ would have been again present, including in its numbers descendants of the invaders who would also succumb to the idea. The possibilities in this direction will be more thoroughly examined later. In a political age, it is natural that the best brains go into politics and war. Those who are equal to renunciation and sacrifice are the heroes of this realm. War politics is preeminently the field of heroism, and the sacrifices in this realm are never in vain from the cultural standpoint, for the war itself is an expression of culture. Considered from the rationalistic standpoint, it is stupid to devote one's life to an idea, any idea whatever. But once again, life with its organic reality, does not obey rationalism with its urge to mediocrity. Thus the best are called from every generation and impelled into the service of the culture. The noblest of all are the heroes who die for an idea. But everyone cannot be a hero, and the others live for an idea. An invariable characteristic of this level is its spiritual sensitivity, which brings it more impressions than the others receive. This is coupled with more complex internal possibilities, which order the volume of impressions. It can feel the new spirit of the age before it is articulate, before it triumphs. This also describes all great men, and one reason so many perish violently is that they promulgated things which were ahead of their time. These men lived in a world more real than that of the realistic people, and these same realists are outraged and burn the Savonarola, whom they would follow unquestioningly a generation or two later. This vital plane is only a psychic cultural unity during the long centuries of the culture, but with the coming of the late civilization, mid-20th century, the dominant idea of the entire culture is political. Napoleon's politics is destiny is even more true now than when he said it. The two ideas of democracy and authority stand opposed, and only one of them belongs to the future. Only authority represents a step forward, and that the strongest, most vital, creative elements in the culture-bearing stratum are found in the servants of the resurgence of authority, and has become political-cultural. Since the culture-bearing stratum has its highest importance in an age like the present one, when quality reasserts itself against quantity, it must be defined now as precisely as possible. The notion of mere prominence must be dissociated strongly from the idea of belonging to this stratum. Wagner, Ibsen, Cromwell none of whom were prominent until middle life, were nonetheless in this plane of life and thought in their previous years. The notion of prominence is related to the idea of the culture-bearing stratum in this way. Every man who is prominent in any field and who also has inner gifts of vision, appreciation, or creativeness naturally belongs to this stratum. Prominence, however, may be the result of accident of birth or fortune, and Europeans have seen two periods in recent history after the first two world wars, when nearly all the ruling politicians in Europe were simply common men thrown up by chance in the distorted life of the higher organism. The culture-bearing stratum has its highest importance now, rather than in previous centuries, because it is a relatively tinier minority. The vast increase of numbers in Europe, it tripled in population in the 19th century, did not increase the numbers of this stratum, nor of higher natures generally. This stratum was as numerous in the time of the Crusades as it is now. It is simply the way of culture to choose minorities for its expression. Multiplication of population is downwards. The tension between quantity and quality grows greater with the increase of numbers, and the culture-bearing stratum acquires a mathematically higher significance. The tension can be suggested in figures. There are not more than 250,000 souls in Europe who constitute by their potentialities, their imperative, their gifts, their existence, the culture-bearing stratum of the West. Their geographical distribution has never been entirely uniform. In that nation which the culture chose for the expression of the spirit of the age, as it chose Spain for the expression of ultramontanism in the 16th and 17th centuries, France for the Rococo in the 18th century, or England for capitalism in the 19th, there was always a higher proportion of the culturally significant than in countries which were not playing the leading cultural role. This fact was known to the extra-European forces in their attempt to destroy the Western civilization after the Second World War and was utilized as far as it could be within the limits of expediency. The real purpose behind the mass hangings, mass lootings, and mass starvation was to destroy the few by destroying the many.
The articulation of the culture has three aspects. The idea itself, the transmitting stratum, those to whom it is transmitted. The latter comprise the vast numbers of human beings who possess any refinement whatever, who maintain a certain standard of honor or morality, who take care of their property, who have self-respect and respect the rights of others, who aspire to improve themselves in their situation instead of pulling down those who have enriched their inner life and raised themselves in the world. They are the body of the culture vis-a-vis -vis the culture-bearing stratum as its brain and the idea as its soul. In each person who belongs to this numerically large group, there is a quantum of ambition and appreciation toward the creations of culture. They furnish the instruments by which creators can carry out their work. By this means, they give significance to their own lives, a significance which the underworld would not understand. The role of a messinas is not the highest, but it is of cultural value. Who knows whether we would have Wagner's greatest work but for Ludwig II? When we read the results of a great battle, do we always realize that it was not simply a chess game between two captains, but that hundreds of firm officers and thousands of obedient men died to write this line of history, to make this day and date forever remembered? And when a threatened sack of society is put down by the police and army, the casualties on the side of order thus give by their deaths a higher significance to their lives also. Not everyone can play a great role, but the right to give meaning to his life cannot be taken from a man. But beneath all this is the stratum totally incapable of cultural attainment, even the most modest, the mob, kanai, pubel, underworld, profanum vulgus, the common man of the American cult. These preside at every terror, listen wishfully to every Bolshevik agitator, secrete venom at the sight of any manifestation of culture or superiority. This stratum exists at all stages of every culture as the Peasants Wars, the Jacquerie, Rott Tyler, Jack Cade, John Ball, Thomas Munzer, the Jacobins, the Communards, the Spanish militiamen, the mob, and the Squab and Milan are there to show. As soon as a creative man makes his resolve and proceeds with his work, somewhere else in a dark, envious soul there rises a crooked determination to stop him, to smash the work. In his later years, the nihilist Tolstoy gave perfect expression to this basic fact with his formula that not even one stone should be on top of another. The slogan of the Bolshevik in 1918 was also illuminating. Destroy everything! In our age, this underworld is in the possession of the class warriors, the rear guard of rationalism. It is thus working, from the larger political viewpoint, solely for the extra-European forces. Previous rebellions of this stratum were all doomed because of the unity of the culture, the pristine vigor of the creative impulses, and the lack of external danger of such crushing proportions as exists in this age. Its history is not yet over with.